Hi everyone, it's Linda. Today I will be talking about cultural responsive pedagogy as it applies to music theory pedagogy. There are roughly three parts to this video. First part is my own experience in music theory classes in music schools in my undergraduate and graduate degrees. The second part delves into what we exactly mean when we say music theory. And the final part contains a couple of suggestions and recommendations for the theory pedagogy curriculum moving forward and a quick sample lesson plan on how we as teachers can quickly incorporate an alternative approach in our teaching. Part one. I distinctly remember an instance in the first year of my undergraduate studies when I suddenly felt like an outsider. During one of my first lessons with my teacher, he asked me, do you hear how this harmony resolves? How this chord, which is so full of tension, needs to resolve to the next harmony? And in that moment, perhaps because I've never been asked that question so directly in my life, I answered, honestly, no. It's such a given, the idea of tension and resolution in European classical music. Many of my past teachers didn't feel the need to explain it or assumed that I felt it naturally. And through oral skills and music theory training in my undergraduate years, where indeed the training is built around this idea of tension and resolution, I learned to hear and feel this motion and gravitational pull of the tonic, which is very much the foundation of European classical music as we know it. Even after I learned to hear and feel this motion, there was a gnawing doubt in the back of my mind whether or not I'm meant to be a musician and this growing sense of an ease and inferiority. Until the summer of my third year in undergrad, so almost three years later, I remember I was at the summer program and we had a composer performer come in to give a lecture about his compositional process and fellow student in the audience who was a composer, who is a composer, asked him, the leading note obviously resolves towards the tonic. It not it natural human instinct to hear that, hear the note with that motion? And the guest speaker answered, is it really natural human instinct or intuition or is it learned? And in that moment, I felt such a huge sense of relief because in the back of my mind, I always wondered if there was something wrong with me that I didn't naturally hear those harmonic motions and the feeling of tension and resolution at the beginning of my collegiate training. For context, just a little bit about my own musical training and experiences. I was born in Tokyo into a Chinese non-musical family and during my childhood, my family moved often between Japan and China. And in that time, I learned the drums in China when I was four. I joined the choir when I was in Japan and learned the melodica. And it was when I was in Shanghai at the age of seven when I finally began learning piano. In my first decade of musical training, I had Chinese teachers. Even when my family immigrated to Canada, we found a Chinese piano teacher through family friends and my oral skills and theory training was done by his wife. In these classes, we even got to explore a little bit of basic Chinese music theory. Though for the most part, we focused on music, uh, European music theory. For the first 10 years of my training, I was relatively isolated in this happy bubble of inclusivity because, because my Chinese teachers didn't focus too much on harmonic motion per se, but much more on colors and expressions as well as a very rigorous technical regimen. The truth is, music theory as we know it, what is it even referring to? Let's ask up our good friend, Oxford Dictionary. Oxford Dic Dictionary tells us, 
Music theory is the study of the theoretical aspects of music and its notation, especially as opposed to actual performance, which is a very unhelpful definition. It's basically saying it's the theory of music. So what about theory? What does theory actually mean? And so it tells us it's a system of ideas intended to explain something. In other words, music theory is simply a perspective. And the music theory or the perspective we end up learning in school is ultimately European male perspective on European male music of 17th to 19th century. In Adam Neely's video, Music Theory and White Supremacy, he points out Anuja Kamat, an Indian classical music singer who teaches Indian classical music theory. Anuja is using Western theory as a foil to North Indian theory, as a means of understanding both of them a little bit better. That's something that we just don't do in the West. I can certainly attest to that in my personal experiences. An issue raised in chapter 11 of Nettle's book, The Study of Ethnomusicology, is that there is an imbalance in ethnomusicologists, where the overwhelming majority have been members of Western society studying non-Western music, or members of affluent nations who study music of the poor, or maybe city folks who visit the backward villages in their hinterland. And so, my question is, if the Western world has such a great abundance of research into musical cultures of other parts of the world, why has it not been incorporated into music theory classes? Or why haven't music theory classes been renamed 17th to 19th century European music theory. As the diversity among European classical music students increase through various initiatives and organizations such as the Sphinx organization or even Juilliard's own music advancement program, where there is an active recruitment process of classical music students that are from backgrounds underrepresented in classical music, it is so imperative that music theory classes are adapted to students' lived experiences. Part three. So what should we do and what can we do? I believe it's so important to include references to other musical cultures, especially during the initial introduction of fundamental musical concepts in European classical music. Uh, my own training is limited and my understanding of music outside of European classical music is even more severely limited. But here's a quick sample lesson plan that I was able to conjure given the basics I know about Chinese music and a quick search on Google. Please do note that this is still teaching uh, music theory from the perspective of 17th to 19th century European classical music. So, for example, if we are to teach the concept of scales, rather than busting out the major scale right away, in this specific lesson plan, I take a Chinese folk tune, which goes like this. to Mozart's sonata in C major, which you may know. And then once you compare the two scales, you'll find that it's a pentatonic scale versus a major scale, which they don't know yet. But if they already know things like the whole step and half step, we can get them to sing and realize that it's the two half steps that are missing in the pentatonic scale. That's why there's the dissonance and resolution, which is so prevalent in classical music because it's built in to the pitches that we use in classical music, in European classical music. Some possible alternatives include showing kids all sorts of different music to begin with, like Arabic music, Indian, Chinese, Japanese, African American music, and European. And then to ask them what makes each music, each type of music sounds so different. And of course, there are so, such a huge range of answers. But one of the fundamental 
things that set music apart is the pitches and the scales that these uh, different musics, musical cultures use. And for homework, you can even assign kids to look up other scales of music and music of other cultures to figure out what other pitch system there might be out there in the world. So do you see how quickly this can help students deepen their understanding of the major scale? Just by including very basic music theory from, the, from another part of the world, introducing students to fundamental music theory concepts. It not only allows students a broader perspective on the concept of scale, but it can also begin to create a safe and inclusive space for students of color.